All right, let's begin. Hi, everyone. My name is uh, Dr. Rohini Pasricha, and I am one of the uh, members of the Wonka YDM group. I am the current chair of the Polaris, or the North American uh, Young Doctors Movement, and I'm honored to be able to speak with all of you today in facilitating this month's webinar in collaboration with our working party on eHealth. Uh, and today we will be speaking about um, the role of digital health in family medicine. We have some very, very exciting speakers from around the world to be able to share their insights with you. And uh, so what I would like to do before we begin is to introduce our uh, speakers, um, as well as our moderators and our translators. Uh, we're honored today to be able to have three translators, Dr. Elaine, Dr. Sitian, and Dr. Brando Cantu who will be um, helping to assist with translation, Dr. Elaine and Dr. Sitian with the uh, Mandarin uh, translations and Dr. Brando Cantu, who will be helping with the Spanish translations. Uh, if this is your first time using the translation um, uh, uh, applicabilities of Zoom, what you can do is to go down to the bottom panel and you can change your translation to the specific channel of your choice. I also wanted to take this time to thank Nikita Pasricha, a member of our Polaris executive team and our social media coordinator, who will be helping to moderate today's webinar. Um, what we will do is that if you have any questions throughout the webinar for all of the speakers, for our team in general, uh, I would like you to use the um, chat function. Uh, please note that the chat function will be moderated throughout. And at the very end of our session, we will be having a uh, Q&A portion. Um, so Nikita will keep track of your questions. If you have specific questions for any of our speakers, uh, please direct that in your question as well. Uh, I also wanted to take the time to now welcome uh, Dr. Sanka Randanikumar, who is the chair of our Young Doctors Movement and who will be speaking a few words before we begin our panel discussion. Dr. Sanka, to you. Uh, thank you, Rohini. Thank you very much. Uh, as the Young Doctors representative of Wonka Executive, on behalf of all my colleagues in the YDM committee, I'm uh, welcoming you all uh, from all over the world. And thank you very much, uh, uh, Rohini, for organizing this webinar with your colleagues. Uh, and I'm uh, deeply thankful to the uh, Wonka Working Party on eHealth because uh, they collaborated with us and uh, supported throughout to set up this webinar. And uh, we have uh, a great bunch of uh, resource persons from all the regions, and I welcome you as well. And I think uh, without uh, further ado, we have to go to the webinar and we'll listen to our speakers who would be giving a, a, a great view and overall picture about the use of e-health around the world and which was of course uh, became uh, very, very visible. The use of e-health in uh, medicine and family medicine was visible in the times of uh, pandemic. So I think uh, now we are fortunate to have a great uh, team of uh, speakers and let's go to that. So thank you very much. And uh, I hope that you will have a great uh, day. Thank you very much. Rohini. Thank you very much, Dr. Sankaranda Nekumara for those words. And now uh, Dr. Pramendra Pasad, um, I will welcome him to who is the chair of the working party on eHealth to share a few words as we begin the webinar. Dr. Prasad. Okay, no problem. We will come back uh, towards Dr. Prasad at the end. Uh, he may be having some technical difficulties. Um, so what I would first like to do is we have our very first speaker, Dr. Shakira R. Carroll, um, who will be speaking with us. Dr. Shakira R. Carroll is a family medicine specialist working in both the public and private healthcare sectors in the Bahamas. She completed her medical uh, and residency training throughout the University of the West Indies School of Clinical Medicine uh, Research in the Bahamas campus, where she is currently an associate lecturer in family medicine. 
Dr. Carroll is a member of the Caribbean College of Family Physicians, where she previously served as the online continuing medical education coordinator. She was also the first Caribbean representative for Wonka Polaris, with the Polaris executives interaction being primarily virtual. Dr. Carroll has noted a significant, albeit anecdotal, increase in the use of virtual care platforms and services locally since the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, and mm -hmm. is grateful for the opportunity to share her overview and insights of the impact of the pandemic has had on its utilization of telemedicine. I would like you to join me in giving me a, a giving, giving Dr. Carol a warm welcome as she speaks to us today on telemedicine and the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on its utilization. I'll now hand over um, the call to Dr. Carol. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, can you confirm that you can hear me, Rohini? Yes, we just cannot see your uh, screen, Dr. Carol. Okay, not a problem. I'll set that up shortly. And just a reminder to all of our participants as well, uh, if you can just keep yourselves on uh, mute throughout the presentation, just to avoid any um, background noises. Thank you so much. Perfect, we can see your screen, Dr. Carol. Great, one second here, perfect. All right, so good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, Pasricha, for the introduction and thank you to Wonka Polaris and the Working Party on eHealth for the invitation to speak to you all this morning. I have no disclosures to make. And what I'll be sharing with you today is an understanding, oh, sorry, these are my terms of reference, my apologies. And what I'll be sharing with you today is an understanding of what telemedicine is, how it came about and evolved over time, and how the COVID-19 pandemic affected the use of telemedicine as we know it. Now you've most likely heard of a variety of different terms used to describe telemedicine, some of them used interchangeably. For example, the American Federation, Federal Communications Commission defines telemedicine itself as the use of information and communication technologies or ICT by physicians to facilitate or provide healthcare to patients. They define telehealth as the provision of this care by professionals other than physicians and telecare as the technology such as apps, sensors, and other wearables like electronic blood pressure monitors, which allows patients to safely maintain their independence at home. However, for simplicity, I will be using the World Health Organization's or WHO's take on telemedicine, where it is a functional subset of health telematics. In their report from the group consultation on health telematics way back in 1997, the WHO defined telemedicine as the delivery of healthcare services where distance is a critical factor by all healthcare professionals using information and communication technologies for the exchange of valid information for diagnosis, treatment, and prevention of disease and injuries and research and evaluation, and for the continuing education of healthcare providers, all in the interest of advancing the health of individuals and their communities. The delivery of this healthcare can be synchronous, meaning the provider and patient are interacting in real time, for example, with video conferencing, or asynchronous, like sending emails or WeChat message and waiting for a response. Telemedicine can be direct, where the interaction is between the provider's device and the patient's device. Hub and spoke, where the patient calls in or travels to a facility where the provider will link in from another site. Or large-scale top-down evaluations, where telemedicine is integrated in, with other digitally-based services as part of eHealth. Telemedicine can also be characterized by the medium used to deliver the service although much of the literature focuses on video conferencing. But how did telemedicine begin? The technology itself began in 1837 with the invention of the electric telegraph, which sent a code and eventually alphabetical letters. 
over dedicated underground wires between two locations. Samuel Morse later standardized the code transmitted. The first recorded use of the telegraph to provide medical services was in Australia in 1874, where Dr. Charles Goss gave medical direction to wounded, wo wounded workers over 1,200 miles away. Then Alexander Graham Bell invented the telephone, and three years later, the first mention of a physician conducting a telemedicine visit was made in the Lancet Journal. In the early 1900s, equipment was invented for the purpose of transmitting heart sounds, and the radio was used to provide medical care to persons out at sea. Then in 1925, Hugo Gernsback predicted the creation of a radio doctor, the concept of which interestingly resembles that of robotic surgery. With the widespread use of telemedicine in some specialties, as well as for rural care, and with medical practices moving from patients' homes to offices and hospitals, physical house calls declined to less than 1% by 1980. Since then, telemedicine moved into its developmental years with the creation of the internet, more affordable access to information and communication technologies, more investment in telemedicine, and those services becoming reimbursable by insurers. Thus, telemedicine was recognized as an augmentation to in-person services, a convenient alternative for non-urgent visits, and a means of increasing equity in healthcare in rural areas or other places lacking specific healthcare providers. The WHO noted in 2010 that telemedicine had a great potential to address some of the challenges faced by both developed and developing countries in providing accessible, cost-effective, high-quality healthcare services. Family physicians recognize this as well, but in a large AAFP 2014 survey, they cited barriers to telemedicine, including lack of training and reimbursement for services. Thus, beyond hospital-based settings in specific specialties, the adoption of telemedicine as a mainstream modality of healthcare remained low with less than 16% of physicians in the U.S. working in practices which use um, telehealth, and this is primarily via video conference. Then along came COVID-19, the pandemic which exponentially changed telemedicine on a global scale. The Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development in their 2023 report noted that the use of telemedicine increased at least 40-fold in several countries, including the U.S., Belgium, Canada, and France. Interestingly, despite the uptick in telemedicine use, in his analysis of Medscape commentary from healthcare workers in more than 46 countries, the perceptions about the benefits and quality of telehealth before and during the pandemic, while improved, did not change much. It was also noted that U.S.-based workers discussed the framework and logistics of providing telehealth, while non-U.S. workers discussed the practice of medicine generally during the pandemic. These findings suggest that the legal, organizational, and cultural environments would influence the perceptions and use of telehealth. The OECD had noted that while multiple countries globally primarily European ones, made legislative changes to improve telemedicine use. The changes were only temporary in several countries. With regard to the implementation of telemedicine, Sithunia Matenge and others, including past Wonka President Dr. Michael Kidd, authored an international literature review of changes to the provision of routine primary care services during the pandemic and found that there were significant disruptions to patient care due to the cancellation of appointments, prioritization of acute and COVID-related complaints, and efforts to prevent the spread of infection. However, while in-person contact was limited, individual primary care practices made efforts to contact at-risk patients to ensure continuity of care. The authors also noted that legal changes accelerated telemedicine uptake with multiple modalities used, the telephone being the most common. 
Thus, in less than a year into the pandemic, telemedicine involved, evolved from massively underutilized to mainstream. During the pandemic, physicians and patients shared similar concerns, including an aversion to telehealth, issues with access to and safety of devices, internet and infrastructure, as well as cognitive and, lang and language and technological barriers. Primary physicians noted a loss of income and patients noted the loss of community experienced in the waiting room. So what is the future of telemedicine, especially in primary care? To answer that question, I encourage you all to think about where and how you currently train or practice medicine and appreciate that while telemedicine has its advantages and challenges, understanding from whence it came will help to shape its future. You must also learn to adapt to changes you cannot prevent, apply your clinical acumen and experiences as best as possible, and advocate for positive changes to improve the utilization of telemedicine in the care of your patients. These are my references. And I thank you all for your time and attention. I welcome any questions you have and comments about your experiences at the end. Thank you. Wow, thank you very much, Dr. Carroll, for that very thorough and informative uh, presentation, going through with us and sharing with us about the role and in the inception of telemedicine and how the COVID pandemic kind of uh, sparked that increase in the role of telemedicine too, and getting us to start to think about where telemedicine is going in the future. Before we begin with our next uh, panel speaker, I want to take the chance to pass on um, the microphone to Dr. Pramendra Prasad Gupta, who is the chair of the Working Party on eHealth. Over to you. Yeah, thank you, Roini. So I am Dr. Pramendra Prasad Gupta, chair of Working Party on eHealth, and I welcome all of you on the behalf of Vanka Party of eHealth. And sorry for being late because I was in the duty. So just now I became free. So I joined in the webinar. So I think it will be a fruitful webinar regarding the digital health. And digital health one of the, nowadays it's being overwhelming in all the countries. And after, especially after the COVID, most of the country has aged the digital health policy and regulation of their own countries. And we are trying to develop some guidelines through ONCA for in a digital health, especially in EMR or using of telemedicine. And we are also trying to connect with WHO for non-communicable diseases, something to do on telemedicine. So I think this webinar will be fruitful to all of you. And if any person is interested to join, our working party is welcome to join. And we are about to finalize uh, young leaders in our executive committee of working party. And even what we are thinking, like uh, we, are, we are thinking to make one representative of each region, which will coordinate with the leader, which will be selected for a executive committee of a working party so that we will coordinate with the young doctors group of all the regions. So thank you. Thank you for letting me and getting me a chance to introduce myself. Thank you very much, Roini. Thank you very much, Dr. Pramenda Gupta. I really appreciate you taking the time out of your uh, busy working schedule too, to be able to share that insight with us. So I now want to uh, take the chance to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Na Wei Lun. Dr. Na Wei Lun is a family doctor with a master's in healthcare management and is currently pursuing a doctorate in business administration. Professionally, he maintains an active clinical practice in Malaysia, and he also conceptualized and co-led the IMU Agsana Fundamentals of Telehealth Microcredential Course, Malaysia's first educational program in telehealth. Dr. Na is particularly interested in leveraging digital health to improve healthcare access and outcomes. With his experience of co-founding an early stage digital health startup since exited, he brings unique perspectives on how to integrate digital health into real world clinical practice and business. Today, Dr. Na will be speaking to us about the use, implementation, and limitations of telemedicine in family medicine. Welcome, Dr. Na. 
Hello and thank you, Rubini, uh, for the kind introduction. And thank you, Shakira, for the insightful presentation earlier. Uh, may I just do a sound check to uh, Rubini? Could you hear me? Yes, Dr. Yes. Nath, All, right. All right, thank you for the confirmation. Right. Right, adding a little about myself, um, uh, Rohini, uh, building on what, on what Rohini has already said, uh, currently in my, I'm currently in the 12th year of clinical practice, eight of which, uh, which are in general practice. And tech-wise, I co-founded a telemedicine startup in Malaysia uh, called Doc in 2020. As a uh, director of strategy, I was involved in looking at the regulatory landscape both locally and in Malaysia and globally, taking the co-design of the platform architecture, and designed the go-to-market and implementation strategy, although I left in 2022 before uh, one. And um, currently, apart from my full-time clinical practice, I'm also leading the uh, telehealth micro-credential course, the tele uh, code developed by Anpana Health with the renowned uh, private medical school in Malaysia, the International Medical University. Anpana Health is an early stage startup, digital health startup, providing uh, specific solutions to specific problems in primary care in Malaysia. I'm both happy and humbled by the invitation that of the Wong uh, to today's webinar to share some experience of my journey in telehealth so far. And looking forward to learning from all of you, who are the team uh, speakers today. What I hope to achieve in uh, today's uh, short session is to achieve the following three objectives define telemedicine and telehealth, address the appropriate use and benefits of telemedicine, address the limitations of telemedicine, and provide a future outlook beyond the pandemic. Well, Shakira has, has, has covered some of these. Um, let's set the stage further by looking at some definitions um, on telemedicine, telehealth, and digital health. We'll begin from the middle, now, telehealth. So telehealth refers to a broad scope of remote healthcare services. And this includes remote non-clinical such as provided training, administrative meetings, continuing medical education, in addition to clinical services. Well, uh, telemedicine is a subset of telehealth that refers specifically to remote telemedicine clinical services. And digital health uh, as an overall, uh, digital health refers to the digital technology and tools such as mobile health applications, wearables, sensors, um, and other digital devices to improve health outcomes in patient care. It encompasses various aspects of healthcare delivery, including diagnosis, treatment, monitoring, and prevention. Now, it's interesting to, to note that while telemedicine was commonly used in the past, it is now gradually being phased out in favor of telehealth which is now a more universal term from the current broad array of applications in the field. It uses, its, because its use crosses most health services, including now dentistry, counseling, physical and occupational therapy, home health, and even disaster management. It has also expanded beyond traditional diagnostic and monitoring activities to include consumer and professional education. And this is uh, a statement made by the Center of Four Connected Health Policy in the US. And in this presentation, therefore, telehealth and telemedicine is used interchangeably in the context of this presentation. Well, next, let us look further into the four domains of telehealth, which includes uh, teleconsultation, telemonitoring, telecollaboration, and telesupport. Well, adding some color commentaries to what is already stated. In teleconsultation, the actors involved are patients to healthcare professionals. In telemonitoring, or in some, some related, some similar terms, uh, is, it is also known as uh, remote patient monitoring. The actors involved are the patients or the caregivers and with two uh, healthcare professionals. In telecollaboration, uh, these are mainly between doctor to doctors, and these are usually between specialist doctors and non-specialist doctors, or between uh, allied healthcare professionals and doctors. And last but not least, in telesupport, uh, these are usually the interactions between patients or caregivers to healthcare professionals. 
And for the purpose of the uh, context of the presentation today, uh, our focus is on teleconsulting. Perhaps in discussing telehealth, um, two key terms here are essential, uh, similar to what uh, Shakira has, Dr. Shakira has brought up, synchronous and asynchronous uh, mode of, uh, of telehealth. Essentially, synchronous is real-time communication. Asynchronous, some, in some literature, we may find it as store and forward, or essentially non-real-time uh, uh, mode of uh, teleconsultation. And asynchronous, this is essentially storing and sending information uh, remotely, typically in non-emergency conditions, where health data and images are submitted digitally for analysis at a, uh, at a later time. And this has been used for various specialties such as dermatology and radiology. Where synchronous, real time, it is uh, pretty much uh, understood. And next, we have a uh, video visit audio visit, and audio visit is usually synchronous. Text visit, yeah, text visit may be synchronous and asynchronous, where a healthcare professional connects with a patient asynchronously via a patient portal, email or telehealth platform to provide clinical advice. And on the most right, um, I put up this information uh, where a recent February 2023 article by Bain and Co introduces the term digital native companies or app or and provider owned apps. Well, uh, digital native companies were specifically founded to provide telemedicine services. And provider owned apps are traditional healthcare providers that have added telemedicine as a service to their existing offer. This difference can impact the approach to service delivery and their ability to scale and integrate with existing healthcare. Some examples of digital native telemedicine company or apps. Let's see if any of them sound familiar here. Uh, digital native telemedicine, Teladoc, a US based company, KRY, um, a Swedish uh, telemedicine company that offers video consultations. Uh, doctors, psychologists, and other professionals, right? And closer to me, uh, in Southeast Asia, yeah, it's Dr. Anywhere. Yeah, it's a Singapore-based uh, telemedicine company that offers online medical consultation, medical medication delivery, and health screening uh, to its app. And Dr. Tours is also another uh, example from Malaysia. Whereas the examples of a provider-owned uh, telemedicine apps um, includes Number one, Mayo Clinic in the US. Yeah, it is a healthcare provider in the US that offers telemedicine services to patients, including virtual consultation with doctors, remote monitoring of patients with chronic conditions, and e consults for other health. In Europe, in the UK, we have Babylon. Babylon Health is a UK based telemedicine company that partners with healthcare providers similarly. In Asia, yeah, there is Ping An Good Gun. Yeah, it's a Chinese uh, telemedicine company that take partners with healthcare providers similarly to offer online consultations, medication delivery, and other healthcare services to patients. Well, I separated the classification by a private line as this is not yet a form of communication. Let's look at how telehealth is changing the healthcare landscape across the world. Well, um, two facts I put forth. In the US, in March 2020, only 13% of the American family physicians member have provided telephone or video visits to their patients. And by, 20, by May 2020, which is the peak of the pandemic, 94% of members were regularly doing so. And in Australia, yeah, um, this is on top of uh, Shakira's example of uh, Belgium, Canada, and France. In Australia, between March 2020 and March 2022, around 70 million, a million Australians have utilized over 100 million telehealth consultations uh, during this two-year period. We now know that telehealth is a valuable tool in delivering healthcare services, accelerated by the pandemic, and is projected to remain an important tool beyond the pandemic. However, it is worth emphasizing that it's not for all cases. A common perception when it comes to hearing telehealth for the first time, you know, uh, as shown in the picture on the right of the screen, 
is like attempting mission impossible. But this is far, fortunately, this is far from the case. Determining the clinical utility or clinical appropriateness is vital. It is important to also to acknowledge the limitations of telehealth, such as not being able to physically examine the patient. Therefore, the mindset shift is here. How might we use these additional tools to gather the necessary information we need and enhance or supplement our existing practice in an effort to improve patient care and outcome? Use appropriately, telehealth increases the efficiency of our work. For example, follow-up appointments, medication management, certain conditions which require limited physical examination may be delivered through telehealth. Patients will be happy too, as they saved on the need to travel, save time, save expenses, and care is now able to be extended to those who are unable to come to the clinic. All in all, telehealth is not a one-size-fits-all solution. It is important to determine its clinical utility or appropriateness on a case-by-case -case basis. And while there are limitations, the mindset shift is crucial in fully benefiting from telehealth in a jump to current practices. Well, this slide outlines the clinical utility of telehealth by the American Association of Family Physicians in 2020, in its 2020 publication, uh, which, we, which is the toolkit for building and growing a sustainable telehealth program in your practice. Well, I, it is a good read for anyone interested in telehealth as it provides an overall view of what telehealth can be used for and how to set up your practice appropriately. And as outlined, the AAFP also suggests, so it suggests that uh, the telehealth can be applied in selected uh, conditions. And in, in this example, six patient group, from generally healthy patients, to children, to pregnant women, to older persons, and for mental and behavioral. In the same document, many primary physicians at AAFP find the following four conditions work well virtually. Behavioral health, follow-ups, and medication management. Secondly, conditions where treatment is heavily weighted towards a visual exam that can easily be conducted on camera, for example, acne. And thirdly, triage questions, for example, assessing a laceration for the knee of a suture. And last but not least, uh, chronic diseases management that require frequent check-in, monthly check-ins, uh, uh, two monthly or pregnant check-ins, example, diabetes. And well, some considerations of using telehealth is on the, uh, the outcomes or intentions uh, that we are trying to achieve. For example, for people acute conditions, what we are trying to achieve, you know, questions like we are trying to achieve safe management, treatment, and escalation therapy, and for stable conditions, including chronic conditions, where we're trying to, where are we trying to ensure long-term stability of the condition, to delay complications, uh, prevent deterioration or overthink. So here are, here are some examples of the public communication message on the clinical utility of telehealth and telehealth, yep, um, uh, provided by the Ministry of Health. Uh, suitable conditions include stable chronic conditions, headaches, minor tons, burns, skin condition, yeah, cough, and sniffle. Now, telemedicine is a game changer for patients and providers because telehealth is more convenient for patients who work or have family. They can now see the doctor without significantly disrupting their trip. Patients who have transportation challenges or schedule limitations are more easily able to access care through telehealth now. And physicians report improved attendance at routine visits and better adherence because of improved convenience and access. Also, physicians say many patients would have delayed or neglected care during the pandemic were it not for telehealth. Yeah, telehealth enabled them to be seen sooner and ultimately receive better care. On the right, I attach a recent uh, February 2023 announcement from the Minister, Minister of Health Malaysia that uh, telehealth is available now in 376 family physician-led health clinics nationwide across Malaysia. 
And this exercise aims to increase the convenience of healthcare services, save time and cost, as well as to reduce waiting. Right. Well, next, um, as we understood the various definitions and uses of telehealth, let us look at how um, possible, one of the ways on how to get started. Well, as outlined, uh, there are it's a simplified five step uh, uh, self -explanatory, explanatory table. Well, um, it may differ from practice to practice, but some more practice uh, private. Right, uh, establish rules and responsibilities. Well, in small practice, we need a practice manager, and in large practice, we need a medical director for operations or IT manager. Step number two, to check regulatory requirements and yeah, make sure we are compliant to local health and laws and regulations, including data privacy and uh, protection law. Number three, customize clinical appropriateness. Yeah, decide on what conditions work best for you. Vendor selection, we sign on platform. And implementation adjustment, this is where we have to do uh, some workflow redesign. Right, let me pause here for a moment to allow you to speak through and after which I will also provide um, additional commentary. Well, let me draw your attention to two points on this slide. First on a vendor selection and a readily available platform, uh, which in, in the previous slide referred to as a digital native, as opposed to using Zoom Teams uh, our conventional Zoom or Teams yeah, for compliance reasons, yeah, because they will take a lot of headache out of you uh, on the HIPAA security and the privacy requirements or any data protection, data privacy requirements in your country. Apart from, they will also assist you on the workflow redesign, yeah, plus patient onboarding and education materials. So this is the advantage of engaging with that. Yeah. Uh, besides vendor experience, product functionality, cost, and training support, and things are important to focus. And next, under implementation, an important consideration in developing workflows is scheduling purposes, yeah, which I further I will, I will further address for you. Right. Well, in, when it comes to implementation considerations, so preparing an optimal environment, this is where deals with lighting, privacy, noise, or good visual is important. Managing of schedule also will come to each other. And documentation and consent requirement is very important. And if, if, you, if you see that, although it's a bit small, yeah, the additional points that we add to a telehealth consult would be the three keys, the telelocation, telemodality, and time loss. In addition to what we already usually do with this objective of active assessment. Allow me to make some other commentaries on the different ways of managing the telehealth. Um, these are the possible good things that you might consider. Um, some block portion of the days, this is called time block. For example, evenings 3 to 6 p.m. Yeah, this may not be expressible enough for, for patients. Some block certain days, some doctors block certain days. These are called telehealth days. For example, Mondays and Wednesdays, uh, telehealth days, and this might be challenging to devote a full day to the telehealth appointment. Okay. Some offer visits outside working hours. These are called on call scheduling. Yeah, for example, evenings and weekends. Well, now um, when it comes to work life balance, this is a challenge. And we may also attempt open scheduling. Yeah? This method involves doing telehealth in between uh, actual work walk in visits. Well, it may, this, this open schedule method may be logistically challenging to manage overlaps and conflicts between the walk in center and the scheduled telehealth appointments. You can imagine um, a patient walking into an empty clinic only to realize that he or she has to wait for more than an hour that the doctor is filled with the telehealth appointment. So, overall, there is uh, no single uh, model that is best for all physicians to practice. It is generally up to the doctor to consider what is most comfortable. Well, acknowledging telehealth uh, limitations is also important, and we'll see how we can address the challenges. Uh, telehealth, as telehealth relies 
heavily on visual cues and patient reported symptoms. It's very challenging to perform a physical examination. And in addressing this challenge, now, physicians can guide patients through self-examinations or collaborate with in-person health practices to obtain necessary physical assessment. To do that, physical, physician education on telehealth is important. Next, we talk about reimbursement. Reimbursement policies for telehealth services vary by countries. For example, Malaysia do not have a reimbursement policy for telehealth yet. Yeah. Um, Still predominantly out of pocket, and this may explain the lagging in widespread adoption versus this counterpart in Singapore, or India, or Indonesia, according to, uh, according to the Bain and Co. report I shared earlier. And to address this challenge, we need to advocate for telehealth coverage, pushing for implementation and reimbursement policies, and encouraging insurance providers to increase their coverage. So, Revisiting the earlier discussion on the digital native and provider owned health. According to the same Bain and Co report, in the mature healthcare market, as the US and the Euro, provider owned predominant and have been successful in scaling up digital health services in the existing ecosystem. But in emerging Asian markets where I'm in, where private health insurance coverage is low, about 20%, private provider groups are fragmented, digital natives. Digital or standalone telehealth companies are able to play a more meaningful role. And this further accentuates the role of a reimbursement policy in catalyzing digital health adoption. Then we look at the technology limitations. Well, this is well, very clear. Uh, not all patients have access or comfortable technology, such as the video conferencing. And um, well, addressing the challenge, we need to provide training and resources to patients to use a technical telehealth technology, improving internet access in underserved communities and addressing technical challenges through troubleshooting. When it comes to poor legal and regulatory framework, as the reimbursement policy, different countries at different stages of fine tuning their regulations on telehealth, the lack of legal clarity regarding telehealth can also pose challenges for healthcare providers and patients. So, the uh, method of addressing the challenge, we can advocate for public recommendation policies that support and educate lawmakers about the benefits of telehealth. Now, what's the future of telehealth? Now, let us listen to this uh, short video clip. I hope it works of an interview with uh, Dr. Christopher Chen, founder and CEO of ChenMed and one of the largest primary care providers in the net. Dr. Na, I don't believe we can uh, hear the audio. Uh, if you try sharing your audio feature, we might be able to hear it then. Right. Um, in the interest of time, I guess uh, I will, Rohini, I think I'll put the link in the, in the chat so that anyone who wants to listen to it can listen to it after that. That's all right. perfect. Is that all right, Rohini? Yeah, all right. Because uh, technically challenging. Right. So yeah, that's the end of my presentation. I hope you enjoy it. Happy to entertain or answer any questions that might follow. Thank you, Rohini, over to you. Thanks very much, Dr. Na. I know I learned a lot from that presentation about how telemedicine works, the different modalities of it, how to implement different types of telemedicine and which one is best fit for certain environments but also remembering that telemedicine is not a complete replacement for the in-person examination and that there are limitations to it as well. So thank you for that. I wanted to now take the chance to introduce our third speaker, Dr. Adele Yeski. Uh, Dr. Yeski is a family medicine physician who finished his residency recently and is working in the kingdom of Abdulaziz Medical City, the National Guard Health Affairs in Riyadh, he is also the Chief Technical Officer for the Saudi Society of Family Medicine. 
Dr. Adele is also the representative of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia in the Young Doctors Movement, Al Razi Movement, and the Secretary of the Movement as well. Please join me in giving a warm welcome as Dr. Adele Yeski will speak to us today on the use of applications in e-health. Welcome, Dr. Yeski. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Can you see me? Yes, Dr. Yeski. Okay. So, hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Yeski. I'm a family medicine physician from Saudi Arabia. And today, I would like to first thank uh, the Committee of Working Party on eHealth in Wonka and in Polaris and Dr. Rahini for trying to achieve this webinar where we can share our expertise and opinion on the applications of eHealth. So I would like also to thank Dr. Shakira and Dr. Wana on the introduction that they made. They made my way much easier to go over uh, and explain the applications of the EL. So let's start. And our objective for my uh, for today is to explain about e-health, or what is the what is the way that we are developing in this field, and the application that are surrounding us, and the new solution in the horizon. Also to share some numbers and challenges in the field, and how can we improve those, and overall take on how you can uh, implicate those solutions into your environment. So this is me, I'm a family physician in King Abdulaziz Medical City National Guard in Riyadh. Also as Dr. Rahini mentioned, I'm working the CTO of the Saudi Society of Family Medicine and also I'm the representing for Saudi Arabia and Arazi Young Doctor Movement. So this is uh, some picture, or this is some pictures from Riyadh where Saudi Arabia would like to all of you to have the chance to come and visit us. Uh, here we can see the main uh, roads, like King uh, Fahad Road, and also those pictures from Boulevard and the, uh, part of this uh, real season. And the last two pictures from uh, my place to work is King Abdelaziz Medical City, uh, where I'm practicing family medicine. And also, we would like all of you to join us in the coming real uh, expo in 2030. So, moving to our topic of the day. Uh, which is the health e health, when, which are the ways we are developing in this field. Uh, starting by the uh, shorter version of the definition, which was shared by Dr. Shakira, it's the use of the information and communication technology in supporting of healthcare and healthcare related fields. As you know, that uh, post pandemic now, we made uh, a huge decision in our uh, practice over uh, worldwide uh, to have more efficiency and to develop and to to deliver more uh, healthcare to our populations. And such way, we needed to develop our ways in using e-health. So what type of e-health application that were used or being developed now, right now? So as Dr. Na was focusing on telemedicine, which can give uh, a huge uh, chance for more accessible choice for medical care. Uh, also, we have the M-Health, which is mobile health and wearables where we can have minute-to-minute -minute follow up and updates on our patients, even if they are not uh, with us in the clinic, or they can they manage their chronic diseases on their own, or if they want to follow up uh, on daily uh, routine or healthcare, uh, healthy lifestyle choices. Also, we have the electronic healthcare records uh, system, which can enhance the healthcare uh, as a whole. It can provide uh, a lot of uh, solutions, and we will be talking about uh, those subjects, inshallah, in, in the coming slides. Education and management at healthcare uh, at all, uh, at big, and uh, uh, it's a choice, but for us, uh, we will not be covering that for today uh, as it's out of the scope. So, what are the applications that we are having uh, in our uh, healthcare uh, systems day to day basis? Starting by using telemedicine, which is using telecommunication and uh, to support the delivery of all kinds of medical and diagnostic and treatment related services, usually by doctors. And focus on the telemedicine on doctors because they are the first line face to face with our patients. You don't know the background behind telemedicine that you need your staff, you need your records, you need your uh, nursing systems, you need your labs. Uh, one at most is that. The, technological part behind it. So the benefit of these uh, is to have the time and resource efficiency. So one doctor can serve uh, much more uh, population using telemedicine. 
also with a better and larger access to care. So we can cover huge numbers uh, of patients uh, with, with it using telemedicine. Also to have faster results and decisions. So if we have urgent cases, we have uh, urgent referrals, we need to diagnose something uh, fast, we can use telemedicine and uh, to develop these uh, decisions. And how to, uh, we, how to implicate those uh, solutions? We need to have a great communication infrastructure. So we cannot uh, just go to any country and uh, just say that we want a system. We need to have uh, infrastructure for telecommunication based on uh, the, uh, the country's availability. So, uh, so after that, we need to have uh, bigger uh, availability for smartphones or the means that they can uh, use the telemedicine with. So we expect to, to serve a narrower uh, population who are using smartphones, but luckily that smartphones are becoming more available uh, cheaper prices. So also we need to have more technological literacy. So we need to have this part in our assist and our uh, facilities where we can teach the elderly or people who are not very familiar with telemedicine and how to get to that uh, service and make it easy as possible for them to, I'm sorry, make it easy as, uh, for them uh, as possible to get into these services. So uh, from Saudi Arabia, I would like to share some success stories uh, post pandemic, or actually it was motivated by the pandemic where we have this uh, two uh, initiative, one called 937, which is uh, a common uh, number or well-known number now in, in the region of uh, even in the Gulf area, uh, where you can call from any mobile or any telephone and you will have a doctor uh, responding to you within 10 minutes. Uh, which is uh, a great service, which was uh, a huge advantage for medical staff and uh, the Ministry of Health and, and our region to cover uh, patients, especially in COVID, uh, in COVID times. But after that, it developed. It can uh, now cover all the referrals, all the lab results. If you really have any questions uh, about any medical uh, indication, uh, you can uh, call this number. Uh, and follow up on what you what you would like to know about. The second is the Saha Virtual Hospital, uh, which is uh, one of the biggest uh, in the region uh, and the biggest in the world. First time in the Middle East, which is a new concept where the Ministry of Health gathered around uh, 30 specialties. Uh, they are uh, providing uh, access for all uh, rural hospitals, around 130 hospitals, which they can consult and they can refer online uh, to all those uh, big names and consultants uh, and specialized, very specialized fields. Uh, this, is, yeah, uh, this move made uh, the access to expert opinion is very easy and also provided access for patients in rural areas so they don't have to travel. They only need uh, the consultation and it will be done for them. Uh, you can see in the QR code, uh, you can scan it and there is a good documentation about uh, what is the Saha virtual hospital and you, how can you make use of it and how to implement such a solution in your country. So uh, for mobile health, moving from telemedicine, it's the use of mobile wearable technologies for public health. Uh, so what, what is this uh, do, does for me as a physician or does to me as a patient? So first it can raise more public awareness about healthy lifestyle. Uh, you can see that people are now motivated to move, to achieve more numbers, uh, also to have to follow up on their chronic conditions like diabetes. Uh, we can have monitoring more minute to minute and real time. Also, uh, and how we can do that is just by wearables. As you can see, it's a growing field, mobile apps by surveys and point of care devices. Uh, also, we can have uh, AI enabled med uh, medical assistance such as any you know, glass AI, uh, which are developing the algorithm now and how we can uh, screen and come up with a new uh, medical programs or medical decisions for our patients. So the examples for, as I was mentioning about medical monitoring, we have contactless glucometers. Uh, we also have wireless ECG devices you can put uh, for your patients if you have cardiac problems 
also for uh, who have sleeping problems, you can develop, uh, give your patients about sleeping trackers where they can uh, follow up uh, at home. You don't need to bring them home, uh, to bring them to the hospital to have a sleep study. Uh, while having a healthy lifestyle, people can now have water intake counters. Also, you can see in your mobile as weekly, uh, we can have the screen time usage. It reminds you on uh, how to modify your lifestyle and get better uh, usage for your technology. Also, as we can have now noise detections, it's all part of that uh, telemedicine, or uh, sorry, telehealth uh, and e-health development and the field is growing. Uh, so those are the application for general population. Step trackers, as you can see in your mobiles and your watch. So point of care, uh, this is the emerging field. Uh, we have more uh, investment in that. So we can have point of care labs. It's, it's old, old invention, but developing now to have it in your patients, uh, near your patients. So you can have it in a primary care next to you, or you have it in a pharmacy where people can go and do it. Also point of care imaging, developing as uh, ultrasound, uh, especially uh, growing the yeah, need in uh, ER and urgent care clinics. One of the point of care can be the Neuralink, uh, which is one of the new inventions uh, developed, uh, trying to, to diagnose at a spot on medical uh, you know, activities or medical uh, conditions, uh, it's a chip and your, uh, that attached to your body. So also with distant diagnosis, we can have the screening apps like we have in the mental health related issues. Uh, also we can have uh, medical AI bots, as I mentioned, where we can have the glass AI or we can have uh, different uh, screening modalities. So going from there, the electronic health records, I uh, think now it's a real time uh, patient centered record that provide immediate and secure information to your authorized users. Uh, so benefits of that, that efficiency and easy uh, daily clinics where you can go for your uh, medical record for the patient fast. Also you can have more clean uh, data to, to follow up and to develop research and to say, have decision supporting system where you may be trying to do uh, like antibiotic uh, cross-reference or you are trying to have uh, medication that maybe develop allergy for the patient in different areas. So this is one of the benefits that you can implement the electronic healthcare records in your clinics. So for that, you need a digitalized infrastructure. So you need a good supporting system for technical uh, support. Also, you can have uh, clear clinical pathways and connectivity between all the departments uh, that's working on this. System. Uh, also to have well-governed documented data governance. So you need to protect this data and who can see them and who has access to them. So uh, moving from there to the number of challenges, maybe in some information that can be shocking or surprising. Uh, so in, in 2022, we reached investment around two, uh, 22 billion uh, over, uh, worldwide in e-health. So it's a growing field where we, people are trying to achieve a lot. Uh, it's growing attention. Uh, for us as medical providers, we need to keep an eye and try to uh, keep up and, and jump on this wave. Uh, it will be a, a lifetime chance where we can join this movement. So 72% uh, was the increase uh, since uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic 2019. Uh, the all high um, record was 2018 before, and we broke that. And 4.2, uh, 4.3 billion was uh, the telemedicine alone funded in 2022. Uh, 26.5 billion uh, for digital health and uh, all time high uh, where they got funded. So startups and companies and solutions are all heading toward e-health because it's a growing field and we are uh, expecting uh, increasing in, the, uh, in investing in that field. So what are the challenges of this beautiful solution that we are all talking about, we are trying to implement all over in uh, our uh, systems. First, we need more research. Look around you for the problem that you can solve and you have it in your daily practice and how to make it easier for all parties involved. From there, you can develop a solution, work with the private sector because they are seeking a more uh, business side. Uh, also to have a more practical uh, business-oriented establishment. 
So uh, maybe in our uh, healthcare uh, system, they are different. Some of them are based on governmental uh, support, some of them based on uh, private sector. So uh, developing uh, goes faster in private sector. Implementation, we encourage you to implement a new technology. Don't be afraid. Uh, try to have it on a small scale. From there, you can go and grow bigger. And the field is uh, eager and will accept your change if it's working well and saving time for everyone. Overall, take some advices on how to govern and lead the change in your practice regarding e-health. First, empower, find the enthusiasts in your establishment. And we saw uh, one example with Dr. Gupta today that he is saying that we need more representation from young doctor movements. And this webinar, me as a young doctor movement, uh, yeah, yeah, participating in this is one of the empowerment uh, examples. Initiate and suggest the changes implement in your uh, daily routine. Include everyone despite opposition even if that they are not uh, convinced with your solution, with the idea that you have, try and push harder. Facilitate the movement and the change in your field. Don't even, yeah, don't be the one who is saying no. Try, adapt, uh, Dr. Anna uh, mentioned earlier. Create and set goals with a roadmap uh, to the solution that you are testing. Uh, always seek feedback on how things are going on and don't just and you leave it uh, on people to estimate that what they are uh, getting benefit of. No, have the feedback and try to improve more. And with that, I would like to finish my uh, presentation today. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach me on Twitter or LinkedIn or just email. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Adalieski, for taking the time to speak with us on the applications of eHealth, going through various amounts of uh, applications that can be used, uh, as well as sharing us with us uh, personal examples of what is being done in the region of Saudi Arabia and the 937 project. I think that is very exciting. And I think, like Dr. Yaski was saying, this is one of the benefits of this kind of webinar where we can learn from one another and each of our regions. So thank you for that. I want to now introduce our final speaker of today, Professor Dr. Nick Gildemond. Professor Nick Gildemond holds degrees in medicine and electrical engineering and a PhD from Maastricht University. He is the CEO and founder of the Medical Field Lab, which focuses on innovation and medical curriculum development. In 2017, he became the professor of healthcare and public health at Gdansk Medical University and Leiden University Medical Center in the Netherlands. In this role, he is an advisor on transformation of health systems across global health. Professor Guldemond worked as a clinical researcher on numerous health innovation projects, often in collaboration with partners in the pharmaceutical, med tech, health, IT, and finance sectors. As a key expert on e-health and integrated care, he is a member of the WHO Working Group Digital Health and a consultant for e-health programs in various countries. NGOs, multinationals, and startups. Dr. Goldemund also serves as the coordinator of EU, EIP on Healthy and Active Aging. We'll just have you um, mute yourself. Um, apologies for that. Um, Professor Goldemund also serves as the coordinator of EU, EIP on Healthy and Active Aging and is a member of the ISO Strategic Advisory Group on Aging Societies. He is also editor of the Journal of Integrated Care and served as a member of the editorial board on the European Medical Journal from 2017 to 2021. Last but not least, let us welcome our final speaker, Professor Dr. Nick Goldemond, who will speak on digital enabled primary care services. Welcome. Yes, thank you very much, Lini. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, too much words. Um, uh, yeah, thank you for speaking here with uh, on the Swonka and um, uh, webinar. Um, so let me share my slides. Uh, just a moment. Uh, right. Can you see my slide? Yes, we can. Okay. Very good. Yes, so I'm going to talk a little bit about digital enabled primary care services um, from a systems perspective, but I hope 
also to elaborate a little bit on the experience from different countries, different um, continents on, on the experience with implementation of, of e-health and, and digital health. Um, okay, well, just as an introduction, um, I, I think we should consider digital health um, in, in the context of the challenges we're facing in, in many countries on, on, on various continents with healthcare systems which are not quite able to cope with the current challenges of increasingly patients which are more complex due to chronic diseases and comorbidities and aging populations. Um, and we have still very reactive, very hospital-oriented healthcare systems, and they are not sustainable, um, and not, not in the West, not in the Netherlands or, or the UK, not in the US, but also not in China. So we have um, many challenges we share together, uh, which is basically uh, a very hospitalized, reactive system, often very monodisciplinary um, or uh, organized, not so much involvement of primary care or other relevant social care services in the community. Uh, so that's illustrated by uh, the left-hand side, while we have to move to the right-hand side. And this is, um, of course, has specialized care should be still there, of course, but uh, we should uh, look for a more important role for community-oriented care. Uh, typically organized in community-based health centers, monodisciplinary, so a combination of different disciplines, not only family, family medicine, but also dietitians, physiotherapists, social care workers, and with a strong link uh, to those relevant in the communities to support also informal uh, care networks. So you could also think about social organizations, employers, uh, it might be religious organizations who can help in this process. So this type of integrated approach we know is more effective in, in dealing with the typical increasingly more complex problems. And um, e-health, digital uh, health is um, essential to make it work, this more integrated approach. And uh, also it, it might provide much smarter ways on how to provide care to patients. Um, I want to also highlight this importance huh, because we see these patients with more complexities um, and we have to uh, combine these different sort of um, approaches from different disciplines, different sectors, social sector, medical sector. Um, uh, we should uh, think about this, mono, uh, uh, this multidisciplinarity, but also that typically these problems are not single issue and not um, only relevant at one point in time. And we have to think about this sort of interaction over uh, the course of time. And usually what we know, if you look to schizophrenia or diabetes, that this can fluctuate strongly over time. Accordingly, uh, we have to have our interaction with patient more uh, dynamically. And not only as, as a single profession, a professional, but also as a system. So how do we deal with this complexity, uh, which requires more multidisciplinarity and also often very strongly fluctuating in time. And also think, for example, about palliative care, where many complexities come together in a relatively short uh, period of time. And still, how, how does it work also from a primary care perspective? to support optimally these, these people in their end stage of life. So what we actually are facing is, is quite complex in, in terms of how do you organize this, how it's coordinated. Um, well, the, had this sort of challenges, we already know from, from a, a long uh, time uh, before the pandemic and for example in Europe had this sort of aging population in combination with increasingly uh, smaller budgets and, and having less workforce available to cope with these challenges that was already before the pandemic a problem. Um, then we had of course the 
pandemic, uh, which is more like instantaneous threats to the system with uh, infection outbreaks. And it's coming on top of our systems. And uh, also the pandemic showed that the stability of our healthcare systems, whether you look at uh, the Netherlands, the UK, the US, Germany, uh, also in Asia, they are typical examples where countries had problems, also countries who who done relatively well. But um, so these the systems becoming unstable and also a sign that we, we can't cope and have to organize differently. And so to, to also show how this sort of um, um, yeah, challenge we have. So what do we see in uh, the digital landscape in order to support this more integrated person-centered care in communities? Well, from what we currently know from evidence from all the different, let's say, applications, whether you look at uh, diabetes management, cardiovascular risk management, uh, there are some promising results how to manage specific problems uh, online, also think about mental health, panic disorders, depression, etc. So they are encouraging hopeful uh, examples where online or hybrid models might work. Um, however, um, those are quite still very single uh, solution problem oriented. Uh, so like the systems are currently are organized, monodisciplinary, often single diseases or single uh, problems, have, we don't see so much yet more integrated, let's say, solutions in digital health, which also uh, is, is a bit of a problem. Um, as some of my colleagues uh, presented here, so the uptake of, let's say, digital interaction was due to the pandemic uh, yeah, raised quite sharply, uh, but still had the sort of uh, using WhatsApp or uh, Skype or whatever type of digital solution, uh, it's it's not the same as providing coordinated care among different disciplines um, and also uh, with, with community and social care networks. Uh, so the fragmentation in systems, you see it basically uh, also in digital health solutions. And, and this poses also uh, a, a huge challenge, even in what the so-called well-developed healthcare systems with uh, high advanced IT systems. Also there you see this, basically it's fragmented care, but in an online mode. So in order to move to better outcomes, we have to look on how to integrate online services in the total process of care. Um, and that's what is what we also learning from implementation of digital uh, solutions is that if you want to really contribute to health outcomes for most disease area areas, especially where you have these multiple complexities, it should be integrated in an operational process. It means that just having an app or a platform is not sufficient. You should look on how people work together, different professions, uh, how the different networks are connected, uh, the, the informal social network, also in, an, in a more physical way. Um, and so, and this poses also a different story on implementation because it's not uh, the, the digital solution as such, but you have to look how people are organizing care in a very operational approach. And this touch upon a huge challenge in implementation across the globe. Uh, because all these stories, all these hypes, all these investments, and the previous colleagues also pointed to that, it doesn't lead to really integrated solutions. And so we shouldn't distract ourselves by consultancy or marketing talk about if you buy a solution, you are uh, solving problems. It might be for a little extent, but not for the most type of the patients we see on a daily basis. So what, um, 
what we know what what is needed and what should work sorry for that uh, uh, um, so we know that coping with uh, high caseloads in in increasingly burden on system uh, with a high workload, more complexity, etc. We know that gatekeeping systems, gatekeeping in primary care, works the best to um, make the system more efficient, because at primary care level. And this can also be um, a, a digital sort of access. If you do the proper screening, you can uh, separate uh, the more complex problems from the simple problems. And for example, in, in uh, well-functioning primary care systems like, for example, Canada or the Netherlands, about 90% of the problems are solved at primary care level. Only 10% is referred to specialized care, which is also good for specialized care because you can really um, dedicate your work to the more complex problems. You don't want to see normally had a very simple problems, um, except if uh, you see uh, as a sort of business model, which is often not, which is good for business, but bad for people. So ideally, had the sort of digital solutions and, and uh, the sort of filtering, the screening should happen at the primary care level. And that applies also to digital solutions. So we um, know that there are uh, some more integrated platforms used in countries, which have this function of as a sort of uh, primary care digital uh, service center where uh, the sort of uh, triage and screening taking place and afterwards uh, there are some models for referral and uh, within Wonka just for the pandemic we did some um, uh, screening some research on these platforms um, also with the current uh, president at Wonka Anna Stafdal but other uh, also some other uh, well-known members um, uh, also, uh, Pamenda was was part of the working uh, group on this. So, um, what we currently see, and you have some variation depending on the type of platform or country or uh, or uh, solution. And so, we see increasingly that uh, platforms are working with a sort of symptom checker, a sort of filtering system, uh, which separates the problems. And, and provide recommendation to an online doctor who eventually take the decisions. Um, in these platforms, again, depending a bit on their functionalities, you see that there are some broker system uh, platforms which looks for the proper online doctor or the doctor available in online. Uh, or you see, for example, these online doctors are uh, located in one type of center, uh, which is a sort of virtual hospital. And also the previous speaker touched upon that. You also find those models in, in China, for example. Um, there might be also some uh, decision support, uh, automated decision support uh, based on the input from patients and the sort of algorithms in the sort of screening and, and uh, the sort of treatments uh, look, uh, connected to those uh, sort of uh, diagnosis. Um, what we see is uh, that they provide a sort of recommendation to a real doctor and based on his experience and background, he, he can make eventually the decision. Um, what we do see, uh, well, I, I'm going to elaborate in the next slide on, on the sort of consequences. So there are monitoring system to follow up online uh, the treatment and having sort of certification uh, rates. Um, for example, in uh, China, where we evaluated one of the platforms was Ping Anku Doctor, which is a very um, extensive uh, platform and more than 300 million users. Uh, per annum. So uh, you also quite uh, talk about a considerable um, uh, number of people, uh, a platform who's capable of handling a lot of uh, 
uh, of a high volume of patients in a relatively short time. So we see cost reduction and efficiency reduction. Um, evidence is still uh, something which, uh, which need to be um, settled. So if you look from the perspective of patients looking for care needs, uh, the sort of conclusion you might draw from uh, the sort of uh, experience we have with these platforms uh, that some of the platforms are doing quite well in, in reaching out to those patients with uh, care needs. Uh, this might also be marketing, uh, but we should be um, um, uh, careful uh, because also these type of platforms, business driven, not always transparent and provide objective information. So that's a point for attention. Um, a, a pro is that usually uh, they are 24 seven available. Um, so that, that's also good in terms of access. But we also know that uh, using these platforms uh, requires some literacy, also in general literacy and digital skills. And so we see or, uh, particularly a young group, people who are tech savvy, digital, uh, in using phones, but not so much in an elderly population. Although people with uh, less education, uh, deprived uh, socioeconomically. So that's also a point of attention. Usually the platforms are high, have a high um, responsiveness. Although, for example, in the Netherlands, um, the digital platforms we have experienced here, usually the connection with the uh, physical world and physical doctors, the real, let's say, family doctors, is not so well organized. So we have some failures with digital platforms in the Netherlands because eventually there were no doctors available. But in general, we see high responsiveness. Um, uh, also, it, it saves traveling and time from patients. Um, what we often see is that the access and the early, let's say, uh, request and, and use of the platform is at low cost. But uh, the, the problem is that some of the costs might be hidden if further down uh, the process. Also, the, um, the appropriateness and comprehensiveness of care is not always ensured. So still, uh, we see very single solution uh, focus. So more com complex patients uh, are not always served, well served through these uh, platforms also not in the referrals. Um, and in terms of, yeah, let's say evidence or what we know is that all these platforms, they are successful. They mentioned that they are so wonderful, they have a high satisfaction rate, but still the real hard uh, medical outcomes are not so much available. So that's, that's a point of attention as well. So a bit from, uh, the professional perspective, I think uh, a back plus is centralized data, uh, usually in these platforms, although it's not always connected to national information systems. Um, and so some concerns also is uh, with these sort of commercial platforms with data ownership, privacy and data protection and how data is, is used. Um, so we see an increase in caseload productivity, but still, if you look to the underlying technologies in terms of algorithms and how well these algorithms are working from a, a, a clinical methodological point of view, uh, there are uh, much unclarity on how this might function. And again, the complex patients are, are really the problem. So single, let's say, um, single simple problems are not so much of concern, but it's more about these real complex patients with complex needs. Um, so that on the, let's say the technology algorithm part, uh, if you look to more the clinical reasoning and, and the involvement of the real clinician in the process. So we see that um, decision support might help. And, and these examples uh, experience we also know from radiology, it's, it might improve, that's, that's, that's very good. 
Um, still, we see also that very much online doctors are in control, but um, we have some indication that all these recommendations from algorithms, they increase the sort of overdiagnosis and overtreatment. And this is also posing, um, well, requirements for the skill and competences of doctors. Because if you are seeing patients online or, or maybe just only by um, sort of recommendation from the chatbot, uh, it, it really is really uh, often very difficult to make right judgments on, on the situation. Uh, so, and we saw also in some of the situation that quite an young and unexperienced doctors who are quite, let's say, cheap for maybe the employer or the platform are, are uh, using this uh, algorithm uh, recommendation. So that's, that poses some concern from um, a, a clinical competence uh, perspective. And again, so quick response uh, in comparison to maybe offline sort of uh, accessibility. Um, but yeah, and, and what I uh, want to say here as a last point is that the handover from the digital platform to the physical world, uh, that might be a real doctor in uh, a community center or a referral to a psychologist or a hospital, usually it's not well organized. And so all these bigger digital platforms, they're working somewhere remotely. They don't have, let's say, um, the, the feet on the ground in the different areas, especially if you're talking about rural areas or countries who are business-wise from investor not so interesting. And there's not so much investment in creating this um, strong connection between the digital world and the uh, offline world. And so that's also something where we have to look how how should it work in in typical low resource uh, countries. This brings me to the to the last concluding uh, sort of um, uh, experiences is that in general, from a healthcare systems perspective, uh, uh, digital health, digital platforms they could increase uh, access to healthcare. Um, I think considering also the previous slide, we have to be aware that it could create inequality because not all people are well connected or have the sort of skills. Also, there might be business models which create further affordability. And also there might be a sort of risk selection from these platforms in in uh, in the use. So, in terms of healthcare services within a healthcare system, I think uh, the use of real time information connected to digital services is uh, good for decision making uh, and insight how the system is functioning. The whole idea of personalization it, hey, might might work well if it's well implemented. You could have cost reduction efficiency. And also digital is more scalable, but we are quite um, concerned about uh, the, the business models of these large, uh, many investments are made, but the investments have to pay back to those investors. Uh, this is not money which is, goes into the system to improve general health and well-being of people, but going to investors. So we should really be careful on overall uh, strategy. Um, well, market dominance, monopoly. Um, uh, I, I wouldn't um, uh, further elaborate on this, but yeah, lock in with with sort of these type of platforms. Uh, as said, has service integration with all these partners in the system uh, is still quite a challenge. And also the regulation uh, on this um, on this matter. So the overall conclusion uh, might be: as so, we see developments and we see some pros and some cons, which I illustrated. But for this really integrated approach, and we screened uh, more than eighty uh, national strategies and health plans over the last decade, 
we don't see so much um, a real success in an overall implementation. And one of the problems is probably that you need as well a bottom-up approach uh, from people like you who are using the system and, and work on how to optimize these services, as well as that you need a governmental sort of um, approach and facilitating this process. So if you do the sort of mapping on different systems, then typical uh, the more Western type of healthcare system are doing well in, in ticking the boxes. But I can assure you also here in the Netherlands, we are still faxing. And so on a daily basis, health, uh, family doctors are not well supported by more than 20 years digitalization. We still are stuck in very fragmented approaches. Despite all this consultancy work, all the money has been paid about large IT companies. And this is again in the context of healthcare systems under pressure. Um, this is, this is I, I think, really concerning. And also for the upcoming countries like Saudi Arabia, there's a lot of investments or in China on um, yeah, paying consultants about how to define and, and building the system. But the lessons learned from, let's say, the old Western type of healthcare system like the Netherlands, the UK, the US, Canada, New Zealand, it is still, we, we are not so doing so well. So we have still a lot of things to do. And I think that we as family doctors, as in the front line of healthcare and using a digital tool, we should be more central in the discussion on how these digital functions should work and that we accordingly should also design the strategies, uh, the national uh, plans, regulations, implementation, investments for upscaling digital health. So I want to thank you very much and my colleagues for uh, for their presentations. And I hope we can push this uh, discussion further also with your support. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Dr. Nick Goldeman, for your presentation and for sharing with us not only your perspectives, but also some of the efforts that the Working Party on eHealth is taking to further implement uh, digital health. It's very interesting to also learn about the role of AI and how it can be helpful in reducing resource burden on the healthcare system. So with that, I wanted to thank all four of our panelist speakers for taking their time to speak with us and share their insights today. Um, as well. Before we move on to the Q&A portion, uh, I know that we are running slightly over time, and so I just want to be respectful of everyone's time. We will do about a 10-minute Q&A session that will be moderated by Nikita. Uh, before we do that, I want to thank all of our participants for taking their time to come and uh, listen to our webinar today, as well as uh, Nikita and our three translators too, for making this webinar possible. Uh, we would like to take a group photo, so if everyone can um, unmute their videos uh, in order for us to take a group video, uh, group photo, that would be amazing. And if you're unable to um, put your webcam on, that is completely okay too. And so, Nikita, I'll get you to take the photo whenever you're ready. For sure. I'm just waiting. I think some people are still turning on their cameras. I'll just give it a minute or so. And bear with me. There's a few screens. So hold your smiles for maybe just 30 seconds, if that's OK. OK, I'm going to go ahead and take them. Okay, amazing. I think I, I've um, captured all the screens. Amazing. Thank you, Thank you very much, Nikita, for that. So uh, what we'll do is if, if you all feel comfortable in leaving on your videos, this is the interactive portion, the Q&A section, and I will pass on the uh, microphone to Nikita to lead our Q&A session. For sure, yes. Thank you so much. And thank you to all our speakers today. 
Um, so I was trying to moderate the chat throughout the webinar. And I know that there was some back and forth dialogue with certain questions. So I just tried to pick out the questions that there was not too much dialogue in, um, in the chat. And if there's anything that I've missed, please feel free to uh, jump in or unmute or re-put it in the chat. Um, so one of the questions is, um, is telemedicine already part of health financing? And is it already covered by your country, country's health insurance? And I know that there was some dialogue, but I'll re-put this in the chat. And I don't know that it was specific to any speaker. So um, if anyone would like to, uh, to answer that question. Okay, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So in the Bahamas um, right now, telemedicine is not a formal part of the system. And so what happens is that the telemedicine visit is charged or billed in the private sector as an in-office visit. And in the public sector, like I was mentioning to someone else in the chat, it depends on whether or not that doctor and patient already have an established relationship to the point that they have their personal phone numbers. Because again, it's not there's not a government phone that's assigned to um, every physician and therefore the physician would have to share their private information in order to have a rapport with that patient. Usually it's the more long-standing ones. Um, but as it stands, it's not integrated. I'm not sure if there's anywhere in the Caribbean, at least from a governmental pers perspective, whether telehealth is integrated into um, the payment systems. As far as insurers go, I think that it's not well defined at this point. And so it's billed as a general visit for the most part. And that clarifies the question. I, I can uh, confirm with uh, Shakira that in the Caribbean, at least for the Dutch part, uh, um, financing and reimbursement is not so well organized. In Netherlands, we have some experience with, um, um, uh, for example, in mental health. Um, and so in some examples, some use cases, uh, it, it worked well. And, uh, but usually in, in family medicine, it's it's the problem uh, that yeah often uh, it's 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 more let's say um, beneficial to see the patient still rather than uh, do a full online let's say consultation although um, you see now also because the 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 caseload and shortages of time and you see this sort of online. Uh, communication is is increasing, and uh, not necessarily only by the family doctor, but also by the practice assistant or anyone else who can do the sort of um, more simple uh, cases. Um, I, I think in general, so still we see that the financial models are not so much aligned with the existing way of working, and accordingly, had it is usually always uh, also a problem in upscaling. Because yeah, if it's not really beneficial for for people, yeah, it's financially, then it it will it's not a very good incentive. Well, and to add on that, um, as far as Malaysia is concerned, telemedicine is still in, in a very early stage, where um, pockets of uh, developments are still um, in terms of uh, employer sponsored health insurance. Where uh, um, of medication, um, for example, uh, employed in, in, in patients covered under employer hand sponsored plans, they may now continue their long term medications for hypertension, uh, intellectual pharmacies, um, paid by the employer through uh, third party administrators or, or patient. Yes, uh, as my colleague said, uh, we have in Saudi Arabia, the system is based on two sectors. So for the general public, we all are, have free access to healthcare. So the governmental uh, telemedicine is yeah, free for everyone. 
But if you have insurance, uh, the insurance companies follow a national council for insurance, where they set the rules and, uh, and the reimbursement rates for each visit. Uh, while with that, the government also supports uh, the, the telemedicine uh, private sector. So they will uh, maybe pay for half of the visit or half, half of, the, of the money needed for this visit. Uh, and the only thing that is uh, controversial a bit is the amount of medications or investigations, if they are following the guideline or, or if they are not following the guideline. So if they are following the national guideline, they will be reimbursed. Uh, if, if not, they will not get the, the payment. But it's fully supported by the government. Amazing. Thank you all so much for sharing your uh, individual um, sort of perspectives and um, what happens in each of the countries that you are in. Um, and so the other question, um, there were a few questions in the chat relating to finances. And then there was uh, also a question that uh, I'll put it in the chat, but it reads, do you think it will change the perception of the population about our professional ethics? And again, I'm not sure it was directed to any particular speaker. So whoever would like to speak first, please go ahead. Um, sorry, Nikita, I did see that question in the chat. Um, wondering if the um, physician can clarify what they mean by the perception of professional ethics, because that's what threw me off and that's why I didn't um, respond initially. Um, just to clarify what she means by perception of professional ethics. Does she mean that patients will think that the visit is of less quality because it's being conducted um, by a digital means? Does she mean that um, the perception will be that it's performed by a healthcare professional who may not be up to the standard to perform that service. What does she mean by that? I don't know if you can open her, allow her to open her mic or if she can put it in the chat. Meanwhile, um, maybe as some of the experience, for example, in Brazil was um, a sort of perception of family doctors of primary care uh, and also the public, often the public system is, is different from, let's say, more the specialized care. And, and there's also in Brazil, the problem that people are prefer to go to the hospital and the specialist uh, rather than, than go to the uh, family doctor. So if I, I, so I, I can imagine, so if, digital services are provided and um, if they are in good quality and taken into consideration at the different sort of uh, needs and aspects of the patient. So it creates sort of confidence. Okay, hey, this is a real quality service. It might, um, I think, leverage also position of primary care, um, but I th it might also work the other way around that if people are not well um, treated and have a bad experience eventually with so-called so digital services connected to the perception of primary care, had they still might incline to see, okay, I have to go to a hospital or a specialist for, for issues. Um, and I think this also points to, uh, you really need uh, an approach from the government, from the ministry, uh, from the associations on how uh, digital health and, and also how the, the changes in health should look like. Because you have to engage the people, you have to let them understand, okay, we have to change. And in, in all the, uh, let's say, policy papers and what we know from WHO, OECD, primary care is really central if we look to the future of healthcare, considering the type of problems. We should align the digital services but in order to make that happen and also to create the understanding, you, ha you have to target different stakeholders and, and, and patients. So this requires a real, let's say, elaborate strategy. And, and ministries can't uh, ask only family doctors to, to push this forward. Hey, this is also pointing to this sort of need for an overall strategy. Um, so 
it may be a bit broader, but it touches upon, I think, this sort of ethics and possession from uh, patients. Yeah, if I can piggyback off that, um, Dr. Gilderman mentions the, a lot of important things um, with regards to how telemedicine or telehealth is implemented and the fact that it's not only a multidisciplinary approach, but the fact that it's complex. You have to have um, an understanding from the public as to the importance of um, telemedicine and the benefits that it can have in terms of efficiency, time savings, cost savings, but also you have to have buy-in from all stakeholders. It can't just be, like you said, the family physicians. It has to be the administrators, the um, governmental officials. It has to be the, um, the insurers, the persons providing the tech support, because you have to have people who can create and maintain these platforms in order to make it sustainable. So um, the other thing too is that the point about quality, um, and I hope that persons on the ground can advocate from their own perspectives, but a lot of times persons don't view family medicine or primary care as important or at the same level of quality of some of the other specialties. And I think that plays a role too in how they perceive the implementation of telemedicine and telehealth, especially since a lot of it is going to be coming from the front lines of, of primary care and family medicine. So again, the public education and buy-in um, is probably going to be the driving force um, at the end of the day. Amazing, thank you so much for uh, answering that question. And I think I see one last question in the chat here that I will read out loud and then um, that'll probably be the end of our Q&A session. Uh, so the question reads, are there any recognized platforms globally or locally where registered doctors can provide their care? And a bit of context to this is that um, there are many brilliant doctors who are currently not working due to personal or private problems and are looking for professional platforms. So I'll recopy that down below. Uh, just in case you didn't catch all of that. I don't know if any of the speakers have any ideas of any potential platforms. Um, maybe. I, I would like, but maybe also my colleagues want to say something. I think yeah, providing medical care yeah, and carry a huge weight of uh, medical legal responsibility and accountability also about the communications. So I don't think that you can provide a global platform for everyone to access. Uh, maybe uh, if you can look up some of the uh, regional uh, organizations, maybe Doctors Without uh, Beyond Boundaries, or maybe if you have the Red Crescent or the Green uh, Crescent, maybe like those um, organizations can provide you access. Uh, other than that, I think you should be looking, maybe you can be the initiative in your region and develop something like that. Yeah, if I may compliment, and I uh, agree with Adele, um, at the, uh, how, what we see in, for, for example, in China, how with this ping on type of platform, is they have, it function relatively well. I think the problem in China is the handover to uh, family medicine in, in the real world. Uh, so because the primary care is, is largely uh, absent in, in the Chinese system, uh, it's really difficult to, to provide a proper handover. Uh, so if you look from uh, a sort of quality platform uh, with also a sort of hybrid model, uh, it's maybe not the best example, although the Chinese government is working on this. I think there are very interesting examples in the Nordics, Scandinavia uh, and Finland, um, 
where you see both, let's say, digital platforms like Dr. SE um, um, and Cree, um, which are, I think, nice examples, sometimes also with this combination hybrid models, community care centers with a digital platform. Uh, you have some platforms from Poland as well. Um, so I, I think there are some examples uh, across the, the the globe and locally uh, local provided. Uh, the bus country in Spain, for example, is really interesting. Uh, it's it's more national uh, oriented um, or regional, I should say, in in Spain. But it's it's for the for the region of Spain. Um, so th there is no let's say well Babylon, of course, in the UK also. But also there, there are some some concerns and some mixed experiences on how it works. I think what what we should and could do as Wonka is that we could feed uh, governments, European Commission uh, in Asia. You also have some umbrella organizations in healthcare. And we we could um, set the standards or requirements for how it should work. I think also, Adele, there's a lot of going on in the Middle East currently, both in how the system is changing as well as the use of digital. So there's a lot of, let's say, things happening over there uh, and also where we can learn from. So I think if you look globally, we should mobilize our expertise, but also our requirements and, and um, yeah, commu communicate this to authorities in order that they can set uh, the requirements on how these platforms should look like. And meanwhile, we shouldn't be um, uh, very practical and, and go on with uh, more, the, let's say, the simple solutions uh, to make this bottom-up and top-down approach uh, successful. Thank you so much to uh, all all the speakers who answered the, the questions and spoke today. And uh, thank you as well to the participants who uh, asked such insightful questions during this Q&A period. Um, so at this time, I'd like to pass it back to Dr. Rohini Pasricha. But before I do so, just would like to also thank her for all her efforts today in uh, helping to organize this amazing webinar. I know I truthfully can say I learned a lot. And with that, I will pass it back to Dr. Rohini Pasricha. Thank you very much, Nikita. And so with that, I hope you all uh, enjoyed this webinar. The recording will be uh, available after the webinar too, if you would like to uh, watch it again or certain sections of it. And so thank you all for taking the time and wishing you all a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you again, Dr. Pasricha. Thank you to my fellow panelists. Thank you, Nikita, and thank you